The first professional African-American artist was named Joshua Johnson, a retired doctor and a nationally recognized expert on colonial artists. J. Hall Pleasant began investigating old stories among prominent Maryland society that a slave had painted the portraits of several of their ancestors. The story, ha the story had been passed down for several generations without documentation. Many families said the painter had been black. According to one story, the slave had belonged to a well-known artist of the period, and his name was Williams Johnson. Pleasant searched old directories of Boston, of Baltimore. He didn't find any uh, William Johnson. However, he did find an 1817 listing for a Joshua Johnston, described as a portrait painter in the sections of Free Household of Color. Joshua Johnson was born into slavery around 1763 as the son of a white Frenchman and a black West Indian woman who was a slave to another man. His father purchased Johnson when he was about a year old. He arrived in this country as a slave from San Domingo, which is now Haiti, sometime after 1770. Joshua Johnson may have been, a, been a, the first black artist. He is the first known African-American artist in America to earn his living as a professional portrait painter. Also, he may have supplemented his portrait practice by decorating furniture. He lived and painted in Baltimore during the late 17th and early 19th centuries. How he gained his freedom has yet to be discovered precisely. He may have earned his freedom through the sale of his artwork. And this is one of his pieces called Family Group. And this is the earliest that we know of. This is 1800. Eventually, Dr. Pleasant concluded that Johnston was probably the painter of a series of stylistically similar portraits. Previously, the painter was referred to as the brass tax artist because his paintings often featured furniture upholstered with brass tacks. This portrait represents Leticia Grace McCurdy, the daughter of Hugh and Grace McCurdy of Baltimore, Maryland. Born in 1797, Leticia was probably four or five years old when this portrait was made. Some of the people who commissioned portraits from Joshua Johnson were not aware of his race. This painting was passed down through several generations of Leticia's descendants, along with a story that it was painted by an artist from the West Indies, the Caribbeans. While the story may have become confused over the years, the fact that Leticia told her children and their descendants that her portrait was painted by a man of African descent indicates how unusual it was. Now, if you look closely at this painting, Leticia is dressed in a high waist frock fastened with a drawstring, which reflects French fashion from the period. Now, after the French Revolution, French women began to wear simple, unadorned dresses to reflect the ideal of the classless society that the revolution tried to establish. In America, these kinds of dresses were more associated with fashion than politics. And of course, the U.S. was still looking to Europe for its culture. However, a similar dressed young female representing liberty appears on American coins and public statues of the period and has a direct connection to the French political origins of egalitarian clothing. The tucked hem of Leticia dress has a lot of heavy fabric, so it can be lengthened as she grows. Leticia's necklace may memorialize her father who died in 1805. Her necklace is worn from hair that ends in a golden chain that may have been a nameplate. Her jewelry was a common mourning custom in the United States until the early 20th century. Often made by person who wore it, the jewelry was braided from the hair of a loved one who had died. Leticia is posed in a fictitious architectural setting and the strange appearance of her dog, and you can look at the dog and see that it's kind of strange, the tail, it has these weird rabbit ears and human eyes. It suggests that he too, this dog, is imaginary and that perhaps the artist 
painted this in a studio. By 1798, Joshua Johnson was advertising his skills as a self-taught genius in the Baltimore intelligence and residing in a neighborhood friendly to free blacks and popular with members of the Maryland Abolitionist Society. By 1810, free blacks outnumbered enslaved Africans, African Americans by more than two to one. Joshua Johnson was also known as Joshua Johnstone. He was active as an artist in Baltimore for over 30 years, from about 1796 through about 1824, during decades of dramatic growth in Baltimore. This means he did not begin to paint portraits until he was well over 30 years old. By accepting commissions from Baltimore's newly affluent families, Johnston produced portraits in oil years before the camera was invented. Now, according to census records, little is known about him since he moved so frequently throughout Baltimore and in the Fell Point neighborhood. Of course, he could not travel, travel further to seek commissions because of the threat of being kidnapped and sold back into slavery. This piece that you're looking at is called Aldelia Elder, Elder from 1803 to about 1805. You can see, again, this is early on in his style. This is called In the Garden, and this is from 1805. While much of his work has survived and is in significant collections, Johnson remains somewhat of a mystery. How he, even how he spelled his name, or even if he was black, or has it all been open to hearsay? No other artist except Johnson painted so many portraits of parents with their children during this period in Maryland. This is called James McCormick Family from 1805. Uh, you could see the little brass tacks uh, on the couch in the background. Beautiful family portrait for that particular time period. Edward Pennington Ruddard and Sarah Ann Ruddard were children of Captain Joseph Ruddard of Baltimore, Maryland and Mary Pennington, who were married in 1796. Edward later became a ship captain, dying at the age of 29 while serving as master of the bridge Margaret in Havana. Sarah married John Taylor of Baltimore in 1820 and John C. Hinnick on May 7, 1825. Although early works show Pill's influence, Johnson soon developed a more personal style in which facial features were idealized, as you see here. Also, he was working on these beautiful lace overlays and other fabric, um, and they really received a beautiful literal treatment. Johnson's affinity for bright, strong colors and precise details can be seen in the portrait here of Edward and Sarah Ruddard, whose air of stillness gives it an unreal, almost magical feeling. Johnson, we have to remember, is a self-taught artist. His work has a very two-dimensional quality and his subject pose are formally posed for that particular time period. Yet there's a simplistic style and a very innocent kind of charm to his work. The oval face, the thin lips, and the only slightly modeled figures of his subject distinguishes his portrait style. And in all of Johnson's portraits, the poses are very similar. The figures have this sort of expressionalist kind of feel to their faces. In this particular case, this is called Mr. Baylor from 1805. You see his kind of pudgy hands and he's holding an object. And often his portraits, they're holding some sort of object, a book or a letter in the hand of a man. It often indicates or symbolizes some sort of social status. Since the same thing appears in different paintings, perhaps they were props that were owned by the artist, because we do know at that particular time, we're talking 1800s, having a book was um, meant that you were a wealthy person. Books were very expensive at that particular time. The printing press had just uh, begun. 
So the sitters sitting may have taken place in the artist's studio, yet it is possible that the props were kept and painted in without the sitter. This would of course give the sitter um, more time um, so that they don't have to just spend their entire day in the studio. The faces may have been done separately at the home as well. And this is probably why he, the, the portraits look a little stiff. The hand looks a little stiff and a little disconnected from the body. But these were devices that were frequently used by portrait painters. Basically, as I said, to try to save the sitter some time. Several other features may, uh, make, repeated appearances in Johnson's paintings, such as a basket of strawberries or cherries that Sheridan chair, a letter, a book, a map, the same tassel, a particular fuzzy white dog with a pig-like face. The name of this painting, or the woman in this portrait, her name is Sarah Ogden Guston. Um, this is from 1800, anywhere between 1800 and 1802. Um, around the time she died, because she lived from um, 17, no, 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 this, this is thought that she lived, it says that this, this piece is between 1798 and 1802 in Washington, D.C. It's the only signed work that typifies um, Johnson's early style. So, this gives us a little bit more information. So he's making all of these paintings and he has not signed them, which of course makes it even more difficult for collectors. From the late 1790s through the first quarter of the 19th century, Johnson produced likeness of members of the city's artisan and middle-class society, such as the Bankston family. And you're looking at a portrait of Miss Andrew Bedford Bankson and Son from 1803-1805. I know it looks like a little girl. Um, we see some of uh, Johnston's, um, some of the elements or symbols in his paintings that we've seen in other ones. For instance, we see the Sheridan sofa with the tacks around the edges of the sofa. Uh, again, we have the hand of Miss Bankston, she looks like there's some sort of fruit. And then, of course, the sun has the fruit. And, of course, the fruit would be considered the seeds, the birth, the beginning of life, right? And then that beautiful lacy collar that we see around Miss Bankston, we also see a beautiful kind of uh, laciest kind of garment that the son slash daughter has on. Only nine of the 13 paintings of children and or family exist. So the paintings have been dated by the children's life dates and approximate ages when they set for the portrait. For instance, this is, um, this painting is called Grace Allison McCurdy and her daughters. Um, again, this is from 1806. This is Mary Jane and Leticia uh, Grace. So, uh, you've seen a few paintings from this particular family, so this gives us the idea that this was a very wealthy uh, family that could afford to have not only one portrait, but several different portraits made by uh, this particular artist. And these portraits would have been in their house. Again, if you went into their house, you would see these 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 portraits of them, and and, and think about it, um, again, showing the family and showing the family in their finest, and then also showing the family um showing the family's environment or their household or showing that popular sheridan uh, sofa which would have been a very um sought after piece of furniture let's go back to johnson johnson also painted members of the baltimore abolitionist society he painted two portraits of black men uh one called the Un Unidentified Gentleman, which is what you're looking at now from 1805 to about 1910 is one that's kind of uh, thought to be. And also Daniel Cocker, completed between 1805 and 1810. Um, this is one of a few paintings he made of African American clerics. Um, I am assuming this could be because, um, you know, this is his job and um, maybe they were not you know, not, um, could not afford it. 
Um, but whatever it is, I found that very interesting that he only made a few. Now, here's the thing. How do we know he made only a few? Because if we don't know where his paintings are, if he didn't sign his paintings, we only know that, uh, know of two paintings, but there could have been more. But you can see in this painting, this painting looks a little unfinished when we compare it to, um, the other paintings that we saw in terms of the amount of paint it has on. So again, it could be also that this particular person didn't have enough time or enough money, right? Although we know a great deal about the people who posed for Johnson's painting, as I said before, we do not know much about Joshua Johnson. The Maryland Historical Society now owns a 1782 court record regarding a 19-year-old Joshua Johnson, a slave in Baltimore County, who was apprenticed to a, black, a blacksmith previously purchased by his own father. The record orders that Joshua be freed as soon as the terms of his apprenticeship ended or when he arrived at his 20th birthday, whichever came first. Interesting. Now this particular painting is called Isabel Douglas Milholland, and this is from 1807. Um, when you see, and I have his paintings in chronological order, the the best thing about looking at his paintings in chronological order is that we can see the growth in his painting. For instance, um, in this particular one, he still have a lot of the uh, symbolic um, items, such as the woman's holding the book, which tells us that she's wealthy and also very educated or learned person. Uh, she's seated, seated on a Sheridan. Look at that Sheridan. It's at a totally different angle. He had, he's given us sort of a more of a three quarter angle of her face and still she's expressionalist. Um, but look at the wonderful, um, uh, color shift in her dress, right? The pleats, the lace around her head, and then her arms, the skin tone. I mean, he really has improved his skill. You can tell he's been painting more. Um, he's do, he is doing well at this particular time. The Westwood children depicts the young sons of John and Margaret Loman Westwood, a successful stagecoach manufacturer in Baltimore's early federal society. Westwood commissioned this portrait from Joshua Johnson, who at the time was one of the leading painters in town at the very height of his career. And we could see that in, in that last painting. I would say in this particular painting, the thing that's that's interesting to me is that he goes back to some of his elements, right? His old elements, like the fictitious background, right? He has this background that it looks like maybe he made this part of the painting in his studio. And then um, the dog, which looks a little bit more realistic than his dog from the past. The dog has a bird in his mouth. Again, I would say that he probably made that part of the uh, painting, the dog with the bird in his mouth in his studio. Um, the, the majority of the painting looks like he made it in his studio and it makes sense, right? There's three young boys and they're rambunctious, right? You know, they're moving around. It's going to be difficult to paint them. So he's painting their faces when he gets a chance to have them stand still long enough. And then it looks like he's painting their bodies and everything else when he gets to the studio. Again, it makes sense, but this is one of his, probably one of his most popular, um, painting. Scholars J. Hall Pleasant also believe that a child, Johnson was probably, scholars J. Hall Pleasant also believed that as a child, Johnson was probably a house servant of a portrait painter, Charles, Charles Peel Polk. Because they have similar styles, both artists painted stiff legs and arms that have a scarcity of modeling and painting on the surface of the canvas. It's thought that Polk gave Johnson his freedom as well as teaching him painting. Again, we know that Johnson is self-taught, but there's, as you can see, a lot of theories about Johnson, who he, who he was, how he got his start. This painting by him is called Archibald Dobson Jr. Again, this is a dapper of a kind of um, portrait. 
we see it a little different. It's an oval portrait. Um, notice the brass uh, buttons on the side. Uh, again, this is probably um, one of those types of portraits that he got a lot of. He's not spending a lot of energy. He's not using a lot of paint in this particular one. This is an oil, this is this is an oil painting is a double portrait of a mother and a child. The mother is a woman who's about 30. She's seated on a Sheridan. Standing in her left is a child about two years old. As stated early, brass, ta uh, brass studded Sheridan sofas and chairs are frequently depicted in Johnson's paintings. It has been theorized that this metallic rhythmic use of nail is an Africanism. Mm, I doubt it. However, this seems really far-fetched, like really. Had the nails been inserted in a canvas, that might be a clear relationship, but since they're merely painted on, it's more likely these were just an artist prop. And also, I would say to you that the Sheridan sofa at that particular time was considered a really fancy, um, a fancy item to have in your house, right? And so being able to paint those little shiny buttons uh, makes sense, so those shiny tacks, because when you look at his paintings, you can see that his paintings are very detailed, very, very detail-oriented. The eyes, the hair, each of the pleats, pleats uh, on the, um, in the garments. Again, this is Miss Abram White and Daughter. This is from 1808, 1819. This is called Benjamin Franklin Yoke and his son from 1809 to 1910. Again, a really uh, nice portrait. Uh, I, I, as a painter, I'm, I pay attention to not only the, the subject matter, um, but also some of the visual elements. And again, we're looking at a painting where there's not a lot of paint on the background, but notice he has this kind of hazy kind of light in the background, which is interesting because previously we've seen like just plain black backgrounds or painted um, art some sort of artificial architectural uh, setting. But here we see that sort of glowing uh, background. So that's something that's kind of new. Um, and then there's a certain kind of softness to the little boy, uh, his face, his hair, right? And the little boy looks like he has some kind of flower in his hand, but the other hand touches his father. A very sweet uh, portrait, and it breaks a little bit with what he has done. I would say that you say to you that this uh, particular uh, father and son, this is a different class. This particular painting is called Alina, Alina Morton. Um, and women and children holding flowers or fruit, it's thought that maybe it meant fertility. Of course, that would be the first thing that most people think of, fertility. Um, and then, of course, holding a book means that um, the person is learned. This is called woman or girl wearing a bonnet from 1810. Now there is a suspicion that this may or may not be his painting. And I think you can look at it very closely and see how it could, you could easily say, hmm, this is a lot different. There's a certain kind of way in which um, Johnson paints the arms. And also in this particular painting, the background color is very similar to the dress that she wears, and we, we haven't seen that before. Johnson produced more than 80 portraits of sea captains, shopkeepers, and merchants. Um, the name of this particular painting is called Sea Captain John Murphy, 1810. Another one of my theories in looking at uh, Johnson's paintings is that I think you can also tell that with some of his paintings, he liked the person that was sitting, right? That he was painting. And in some of his paintings, you can see that he didn't really care for them. He got their likeness, but there's not a lot of paint on there. Or he just, he, 
sometimes they don't look happy or nice. Now this is a wonderful painting. I feel like he has his skin color, looks really wonderful. There's a beautiful red kind of glow in the background of the painting. Um, this young man or this young captain has really interesting or nice energy um, uh, in which we don't quite see often. This is a portrait of Miss Barbara Baker Murphy, and she is the wife of the sea captain. And so you can see what I mean here. He has a nice likeness of her face, but the rest of her body looks a little flat, uh, especially when you look at it and compare it to the sea captain. This is another one of his paintings. This is called, or thought to be one of his paintings, I should say. This is called The Unidentified Woman. This is from 1810. Uh, it has similarities with the arm. It has similarities with the um, the couch, right? The Sheridan couch. Although this time the Sheridan couch has a little bit more detail than we're accustomed to. So this is one of those that I would say, mm, we're not quite sure if it's his or not. But it's been said it's his. Here's another painting that's been, um, this is called Edward Asquith another portrait from 1810 and it's thought that it's his but you know if he didn't sign his paintings it's really challenging this is um the other portrait is just simply called gentleman from 1810 1815 and we can look at this and see that it's very similar to the other portrait that he created of uh, of an african-american and could be a a some sort of um, draft. Maybe he made two portraits. This painting is called John Jacob Anderson and Son. And this is from 1810 to 1815. And look at what's in their hands. Only one son looks like he has a little piece of paper of some sort of weird shape. Um, notice that the children's arms, especially the one that's to the left, uh, look like it's disconnected. It's a little longer than it should be, um, as well as a little boy to the right. And again, I would say to you that he probably, uh, the artist Joshua Johnson, probably uh, made um, most of this painting in his studio and just had them in uh, to do a few uh, settings, to do the portraits of their faces. Uh, including the father, who looks like he didn't have a lot of time, and then everything else constructed in the studio, and that's when you get this kind of stiff limbs and stiff kind of pose. The proof that Joshua Johnson existed was discovered in the will of Miss Thomas Everett, the wife of a wealthy Baltimore businessman, whom had his family portrait done by the brass tack artist. She left this painting to her daughter in her will, claiming that J. Johnson had painted it. With this documentation, art historians were able to establish which works of Johnson um, can, that were stylish, stylishly similar enough to be his, while the Everett will establish that the brass tax artist was Joshua Johnson. It did nothing to establish his race, which is still... Is still a mystery. His later work is more tightly painted and includes several large family portraits, such as this one, Miss Thomas Everett and her children. This is the only painting that can be traced to Joshua Johnson through a patron's family record. Now let's look at this painting. He is at his peak. This is Joshua Johnson, a mature Joshua Johnson, who made this painting in 1818. Look at this. He has, first of all, there is six people in this portrait, right? Or a portrait of six people, right? Each one of them look pretty different. And again, I would say that it looks like he has been, uh, he spent, he, he did a lot of the work in a studio, but it also in this particular painting looks like he may have actually spend a little bit more time making um, the the figures in, in this painting a little more lifelike, right? Look at the little boy in the red. He's the only one in the red. He's pointing to or holding some cherries, right? 
And then when we look at the little baby also has some sort of fruit in their hand. And then we look at, it looks like maybe a little girl to the left. She has that weird kind of arm, which lets us know that either that arm got painted in last. <laughs> it got painted in last because the other arm looks pretty good. And, and just in general, um, the little boys notice that the little boys to the right, right? They have books, so they're learning, they're being tutored, right? And then we have that Sheridan sofa, right? And we don't have a fake background. So this tells us that Joshua Johnson was probably in the house of this particular family, uh, in the family of the Everett's. And um, he was able to, I guess, being in, in the house, he have access to the... Um, to the children, but also you, he has this interesting space that we're not accustomed to seeing in his other paintings. I mean, everything about this painting shows that this is his mature period. The color complex, the, the blacks, the blues, the greens, the placement, right? He, again, this is probably, I, can, I would consider to be his masterpiece, but let's move on. In the mid, 1980s, the Abbey Aldrich Rockefeller Folk Art Center began a major study of the issue of Joshua Johnson's race. The curator of the center at Carolyn Weekly focused her study on the family stories that first had interest pleasant nearly four decades earlier. The weekly study focused on the idea that Johnson was West Indian. This theory would explain the racial ambiguity from the Baltimore directories that the Pleasant had first discovered. And one, Joshua Johnson is listed as a free household of color. Yet in an 1800 census, Johnson is listed as a free white householder and that this household consists of his immediate family and a free black. An obvious conclusion would be that Johnson was a was such a light-skinned black man that he could pass for white, and at times he did. This further supports the West Indies theory because in the West Indies, racial intermixing was far more common than in colonial America. The name of this painting is Alicia, uh, Alicia Stansberry. Uh, again, there's no date on this particular piece. I put it here because looking at his work i would say that it's older work if it indeed is his painting here is another painting that has been again there have no date on this but this is a painting that has been um said to be a joshua johnson painting i would say that there's some similarities but that weird design that looks kind of like a chair in the background makes me think huh i'm not quite sure but the study never undercovered any definitive documentation of Johnson's race. But it did raise some interesting new possibilities. The most significant was that Johnson was a French-speaking slave inherited as a young boy by Charles Wilson Peel, a prominent Baltimore portrait, portraitist and outspoken abolitionist. Now, according to this theory, for which there is almost no documentation, Peel may have inherited the young Johnson from his brother-in-law and employed him as his, his assistant. As such, Johnson would have been exposed to portraiture as it was practiced in. The weekly study explains that Johnson's style was very similar to Peel's. This theory has critics who point out that Peel kept extensive diaries and never once mis mentioned a Joshua Johnson or any artist's apprenticeship. And I always say that, you know, why would he say it? Why do, how do we, why would this artist say that he was apprenticing his slave? Where in history have we seen that? Try, we haven't. And most artists that we call masters had some sort of assistant but they never put their assistant's name on the portrait or the painting or whatever. So I think this is a crazy idea that, um, I shouldn't say crazy idea, but it's a strange idea that you would think that he would, that um, the artist Pill would put in his, his diaries that, his, that he apprenticed his slave. Anyway, maybe that's just me. 
No further records appeared around Joshua Johnson, the blacksmith, but the Baltimore City Directory has an entry for a Joshua Johnson, the portrait painter, from 1796 to 1824. And this, again, is another one of those paintings that has been um, said to be a Joshua Johnson painting, and this one is called The Portrait of a Woman. And I think that, you know, these paintings that don't have a date to them or any kind of connection um, but are said to be Joshua Johnson. You could see the similarities, but then you have um, some weird elements, like for instance, that that um, curtain with the landscape in the background. We've not seen anything like that, and that landscape looks more like a, a little bit more realistic than some of the architectural um, landscapes and things that we've seen before. But let's move on and talk more about Joshua Johnson who died in 1830. The exact location of his burial place is unknown. Following his death, his works were attributed to other artists. So it has taken massive research for many years to reveal his paintings. It's estimated that Josh, uh, Joshua Johnson, who received minimum training, if any, in art, painted for anywhere between 25 and 30 years in Baltimore, and that he may have executed anywhere between 200 to 300 paintings. 110 have been identified as his. Now at auction, a Joshua Johnson original can bring about 4,500 to $100,000. And maybe by this time, maybe even a half a million. His paintings now hang in museums such as the Metropolitan Museum in New York City, the Newark, New Jersey Museum, Colonial Williamburgs, the Concordia Gallery, the National Gallery in Washington, D.C. Johnson's work can also be found locally in the Baltimore Museum of Art, the Pill Museum, and the Maryland Historical Society. Joshua Johnson is known as the first professional African-American artist in the U.S.